Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. I had to get in the habit of not saying open to Revelation, but instead say open to Jude. And I won't even say to Jude chapter 1 because guess what? There's only one chapter, so we're only going to read uh, one verse here tonight. Actually, we're going to really deal with one verse this evening, but I believe we'll read the entire book tonight because I think it'll just give us a good introduction to what we see here this evening. Uh, I think the best way to summarize the book is really to read the book. I could give you a five or ten minute summary of the things that we find here, or we could just read this brief but bold epistle on our own, and we'll read all 25 verses in just a moment. But one of the things that I really want us to focus on here tonight is we really focus on the first verse, the introductory remarks of the book of Jude. I want us to come to understand that when we see Jesus, as well as the effect of bad doctrine, it should move us into action. What we're going to see tonight is when we see Jesus, but we also see the effect of bad doctrine, that these things together ought to move us forward to action. That's really what the book of Jude is all about, and I want us to kind of get into that here tonight. So let's just do it. Here, verse number one, uh, Jude chapter one, uh, the only chapter. It says this, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Oftentimes the most remembered verse or even phrase of the book is right there, earnestly contending for the faith. We'll look at that more here in a couple of weeks. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees without fruit, rather whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of these ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. I can't wait to get to that verse and talk about all the ungodliness going on in verse number 15, because there's a lot of it. Verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken because of the apostle, before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk their, or walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 
and of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. You can see from what we just read why I've called this brief but bold. This small epistle is a broadside against false teaching and false teachers. So as we introdu introduce the book this evening, I want us to focus on just a few key areas to help us get a better understanding of who Jude is and why he's writing this book here in the first place. So first of all, number one, we see the writer of the book. The writer of the book. Now, guess what? Here it is, Jude. Point number two. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm a Baptist preacher, so we have to go a lot deeper than that, don't we? Uh, the, the writer of the book is Jude. There, there's no doubt of that. But did you know that in the Greek, the name Jude would be Judas, or in the Hebrew, it would be Judah. So we're actually more familiar with this name than maybe you would have first thought of when you hear the name Jude. When I think of Jude, I think of my mom, because that's what my dad would always call my mom, Judy. He would call her Jude a lot of times, and so I think of my mom, but I know that that's not short for Judy, but it's rather short for a nickname for Judah or Judas. So that begs the question, okay, it's Jude, Judah, Judas, so who exactly wrote the book? Well, that's why we see letter A, the possibilities of authorship. By the way, good luck getting that in that one line. I just realized I probably didn't give you enough space on the back of your prayer bulletin, but that's okay. You can summarize if necessary. The possibilities of authorship. Who are the possible Judes that we could find in the New Testament to be the writer? And I, by the way, I believe this is important. Although we cannot know for certain, I do believe it will help us give greater understanding and clarity to that which we're reading about here in the text. Believe it or not, there are five possibilities that you can find in the New Testament that would be a Jude or a Judah or a Judas. Uh, the first would be this, Judas the disciple. There was one of the disciples that was called Judas, always the son of James. Now, by the way, if you were a disciple and your name was Judas, you would always want to say, hey, not that one, right? Uh, <laughs> the son of James. And so you always find him in the word of God as Judas, the son of James, otherwise known as not that Judas. There's also Judas, the brother of James. And, believe it or not, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. We'll look more at that in a moment. There was also a Judas of Damascus. In Acts chapter 9, you remember when Saul was on the Damascus road and met Christ and was blinded and he stumbled his way into town. He stayed at the house of one who was named Judas there in Damascus. So that's another possible Judas. There was also a man named Judas Barsabas. He was found in Acts chapter 15 and he was a member of of the church of Jerusalem who took a letter explaining some doctrinal situations that were taking place in a conference at Jerusalem and Judas Barsabas helped take that letter back to the saints who were at Antioch because of the questions of the Judaizers that they had raised up about whether the Christians should still have to follow the Jewish law. So Judas Barsabas is mentioned there. And the fifth and finally and of course the one who we know is not the writer of the book of Jude is Judas Iscariot. He would be the fifth and obviously the most in, uh, infamous of those Judases, Judes, Judas that are found in the New Testament. So, sure, there's some possibilities of the authorship, but let's ask ourselves the question, letter B, who's the probable author? Who is it? Pastor, who do you think the author of Judah is, or Jude rather is, and I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you were uh, concerned about that here tonight. And I think the best way for us to know is to be able to compare Scripture with Scripture. While I cannot tell you with 100% authority that I know who the author is, I do believe the Word of God makes it pretty clear uh, who this author is. The first hint is given to us in Jude, verse 1. Look at it again. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So we have been given one identifier by Jude, and that's this, that Jude is a brother of James. Well, can we find who that is? Well, I believe we can. Now, you can put your ribbon there in Jude. We're going to go look at a few other places here in our text tonight. So why don't you go to Matthew chapter 13. Very quickly, we'll see some mentions of this Jude. Matthew chapter 13. We'll 
We'll look at verse number 55, Matthew 13, 55. Jesus is teaching in Nazareth. He is going to the synagogue, and you'll remember that there is not much honor for a prophet in his own country, that Jesus is not accepted there with amongst his, uh, his kinfolk. But it says in verse number 55, Is not this the carpenter's son? We know that that would be Joseph. Now, we understand, was he Joseph's son? He was not. He was the son of God. But in their minds, he would have been Joseph's son. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. So there would be a Jude that is mentioned here as a half-brother of Jesus Christ who also has a brother named James. All right, let's look at Mark chapter 6. The book of Mark chapter number 6. Let's give those Bibles a workout tonight. All right. Like hearing those pages turn. Or like hearing your electronic thing scroll. Either one. All right. Either way. It's all the Bible. Amen. All right. Mark chapter 6. Let's look at verse number 3. Same text. A companion text here. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? By the way, I do think it's interesting. This isn't, this isn't my message. But he's not identified here as the carpenter's son. He's actually identified as the carpenter showing that he had picked up some of the trade of which Joseph had taught him over those, you know, 30 years before his public ministry. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So once again, we see there's a mention of a Judah who could be Judas or Jude, who also has a brother named James. And this would mean, if this is what we see here, we connect these two texts with what we read in the book of Jude, that the author of the book of Jude, in my estimation, is clearly Judah, Judas, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, whose brother, James, would end up being the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15 tells us that after Peter was going on an itinerant ministry more than the leadership that he had given the church of Jerusalem in those early days, that James, the brother of Jesus, assumed uh, the authority there of that church as pastor, which would mean that very likely the book of Jude, written by the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and in the same vein, the book of James, also written by the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly enough, Jude and James were not actually initially believers that their half-brother was the Savior. Awkward. Imagine growing up in a house with Jesus. I mean, you couldn't do anything wrong. He always knew what you were doing. He would, he would never join in with any of the things that were going on. In fact, I think it's enlightening in some ways that we don't see much of Jesus' rearing years all the way up to verse number 30, other than that very small glimpse. We get Luke chapter 2, when he was about his father's business at age 12 there in the temple. But other than that, we really don't see a lot of his life, uh, but we don't, so we don't understand the family dynamic that Jesus had half-brothers, that Jesus had half-sisters. But Jude and James and really the family did not believe that their brother was the Son of God. John chapter 7, verse 5 says this, Neither did his brethren believe in him. So Jesus went through his ministry without his own family believing that he was the Savior. Now may I remind you that Mary, his mother, did believe what the angel had said. I believe Joseph did as well. Mary acknowledged in Luke chapter 1 that the baby that was within her was her Savior. By the way, that'll make a mess of Catholic doctrine right there. Uh, the fact that she needed saving. Why? Because she was a woman that was highly regarded by God, a woman of great character, but yet also a sinner who needed a Savior. The very baby that was within her womb, put there by the Holy Ghost. And so the brethren of Jesus... The sisters of Jesus did not believe that. But we do find after the resurrection, Acts chapter 1, verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
with his brethren. So somewhere between the beginning of the book of John and the day of Pentecost, or, or before the day of Pentecost, because Acts chapter 1 deals with the days before Pentecost, somewhere along the line, his brethren believed. Now, this is just my estimation. You could take it for what it was. I believe that Judah, Jude, and James became believers after the resurrection. You say, why would you say that? Well, you'll remember that at the crucifixion, Jesus' mother was there. But in those final moments, and just showing the absolute love of Jesus Christ, that when he was carrying the sins of all of mankind, he still looked at his mother and he said this, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. Now, I believe one of the reasons that Jesus made that declaration was because Jude and James weren't there. But I believe after the resurrection, they came to understand that their brother was Lord and became believers. And I think understanding that Jude was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and I may not say half-brother every single time I address this, but you understand what I mean when I call him his brother. We know that they did not have the same parentage in the sense that they had different fathers. But you understand the shorthand of what I may say time and again, but I want to make sure that we're doctrinally on the same page, that we understand uh, what I'm trying to get across. But although they were not believers, they came to realize that their own brother was the Son of God. And I do think it's interesting that if you go back to Jude chapter number one, how does he open the book? He opens the book this way. Jude the brother of Jesus Christ. Oh, wait, we already read this. You, you know that's not what it says. What does it say? Jude the servant. You know, I think sometimes, and I, I think some of us have talked about this, this subject here at church before, the idea of being a humble servant. You know, it's a, a, a term that we use sometimes, being a humble servant. You know, you can't do better than being a servant. And by the way, I'm so humble as a servant. I want to tell you how humble I am. Never mind. Oh, that's... No, that's not right. Uh, but being a humble servant, you know, we think that's so lowly. But here is a man whose calling card was that he was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And how does he identify himself? He says, I'm the servant of Jesus Christ. In fact, you can go into the Greek and find the idea of a bond servant willingly placing himself under the authority of another. How many little brothers want to put themselves under the authority of the big brother? This only child don't know much about it, but I'm smart enough to know not many. And sure not going to be any little brothers saying, my big brother is Lord. Some big brothers may want to make their little brothers say that, but that's not the way that it works. But he got to the point where he realized, listen, I got to put all this to the side. I may have grown up with him, but I serve him. He's my savior. It just goes contrary to what the human flesh wants to do. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever known this, but I have actually uh, spent time with Manny Ramirez before. Um, have I mentioned that here? Tim, you know that? Um, I, uh, I, I happen to, Vince, uh, anything? Vince, Vince has a toll receipt. Um, but uh, um, I, I have this picture in my office right here, and I want this online. Zoom in on this, fellas. I want, I want, the, I want people online to see this right here. Uh, you, do you know, do you know, Manny, you ever think you'd be spending time with Manny Ramirez? But, uh, um, uh, you know, it's amazing that when I tell the story, you zoomed in. I, I mean, I want this, I want that good, Anthony. I'm going to check later, all right? I'm going to check on your handiwork right now. All right, good. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I just brought that out as, as more of a gag than anything. But it's funny that, that that conversation, especially afterwards, came up quite a bit. Like, hey, you know Manny Ramirez? You know Manny Ramirez? Yeah, because I got his phone number. You don't got his phone number? Can I have his phone number? Like, no, you can't. Uh, but uh, uh, you have his address? What's the, you know, it, it's just like, because there's something about the human condition that if we know somebody or have a connection with somebody that somebody else does not have, if we feel like it's highly prized, a lot of times we kind of want to hang it out there to people a little bit. Uh, hey, I know Manny Ramirez. And then I, I've, I've told the same stories 
dozens of times to people when the conversation comes up about, yeah, he came to the church and I met with him in my office and we went to this place and we went to that place and just uh, I tell the stories. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to lie, that they're, they're funny stories to tell and, and I'm glad that in that short time we were able to have with him. And by the way, if you don't know, Manny uh, had given a testimony of coming to faith in Jesus Christ after his playing days and it was a blessing to be able to talk to him about some of those things. He's still Manny in every conceivable way, but yet he has this testimony now of accepting Christ uh, as a savior, and I'm thankful for that. But here's Jude, who could go around and saying this, hey, you know who I am? I grew up with Jesus. And you're not telling me that there wouldn't have been hundreds, if not thousands of people who said, we've always wanted to know what it was like when he was a kid. Because I read this, and I want to know what he was like when he was a kid. And you're meeting one of his siblings. And what does Jude say? I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Is there not a lesson there for us tonight? This isn't the message, but is there not a lesson for us? If a man who grew up with Jesus Christ said, I don't really want to talk about that. I want to talk about me serving him. That's how I want to be identified. Who are we to try to make anything of ourselves? Who are we to think that we have attained some level of anything on any hierarchy of any ladder that exists anywhere. Man, who are we? We're just servants of Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do. Uh, that's why we serve the way we serve. That's why we just jump in wherever we can jump in and help wherever we can help. Why? Because we just want to do the work of the ministry because we love our Savior. And I think that's a powerful thing here. Here's a man who could have based his life on something, by the way, that he wasn't in control of. That's the thing. Wow, Jude, you're great. Yeah, he had nothing to do with it. And it's amazing how people have made careers out of being at the right place at the right time that had nothing to do with anything. They're 15 minutes of fame that just happened to be right there where the action was with a cell phone in their hand or a camera in their hand or something like that. But here's a man, he realized, I know who I am. I'm a servant of Jesus. So we see the writer of the book, and I believe that it was the half-brother of Jesus. Number two, we see the reason for the book. What's the reason of the book? Why are we reading it? Why is it here? Why is it part of the canon with the other 65 books of Scripture? And I will tell you, just reading the book that we just did, all 25 verses just a moment ago, there's no doubt that Jude is passionate. And he is passionate about this issue of people who have misrepresented the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Hey, wouldn't you be fired up if people are talking wrong about your brother? It's funny that you can talk bad about your brother, but someone else talks bad about your brother. Like, what are you doing? You know, I don't know much about how that works. Again, that dynamic, but I do know this. Families that squabble together, it's kind of like, hey, we can squabble with each other. It's not your business. You try to jump into this. Uh, you've, you've done something wrong here. Yes, that's the way it is, all right? And so, <laughs> so some of you want to do that while I'm preaching before. But you've never had the boldness to do so. so uh, but you know what? Uh, his brother is being misrepresentative, and uh, misrepresented rather. But I will say this, that you read this text, and this was much more than a familial issue to Jude. This was much more than, hey, you've hurt my family loyalties. This is Jude, like Peter, who saw what false teaching was doing to the faith. There's a lot of false teaching that's out there today. I don't know if any of you heard that recently. There's a lot of false teaching that's out there today under the banner of Christianity that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But that was true almost 2,000 years ago. And what's interesting about that is that Jude, and this is one of the reasons I think this is going to be so great for us to go through while we're going through 2 Peter, is that there are echoes of 2 Peter in Jude, which is why I believe that 2 Peter was actually written first and then Jude written right after. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 3 very quickly. You're just a couple pages away. 2 Peter chapter number 3. And look at verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. And we'll just stop right there for just a moment. Would you say that as we look around the culture today, that there are those who are scoffing at things that are good and right and godly? I mean, you couldn't answer any other way. That the culture, society, government, 
is mocking that which is good and right and just. It's happening all around us. But it was happening then too. So we see that written in 2 Peter chapter number 3, but then turn back to the book of Jude. Again, just a few pages away. You were just there. Look at verse number 17. Jude 17. It says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own godly lusts. Now where did Jude hear that? I would say it was from the apostles, but perhaps the one who said it first would have been Peter who put it by the inspiration of God in 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 3, and Jude makes reference of it in his epistle because he's saying, do you think it's getting better? It's not getting better. It's gotten worse. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons it seems clear to me that 2 Peter was written first and then the epistle of Jude after because Jude is making a callback to 2 Peter. There are some that believe that this book of Jude was written somewhere around 69 to 70 A.D., right before Jerusalem fell. There's no way to prove that. There's some who say, well, there's no mention of Jerusalem falling in this epistle. And while that's certainly true, there's also no mention of Jerusalem falling in 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John either, which are seem to me very likely to be written anywhere from 80 to 90 A.D. So we do know this, that it was probably after A.D. 67, 68, that the book of Jude was written. And Jude is saying this, after Peter told you things were getting bad, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And 2,000 or so years later, it's getting worse, which means this. This is just as relevant as it was all the way back then. This is just as relevant as if you watch the news tonight. I'll be honest with you. It's even more relevant than if you watch the news tonight because at least you know this is true. You say, we shouldn't talk about politics. I'm not. It's just a fact. What's the reason for the book? Well, there's a couple of reasons quickly, and we're going to give these in summary here tonight because we're obviously going to sink our teeth pretty deeply into this over the next couple months. First of all, there was a description of false teachers, a description of false teachers. Uh, uh, some are mentioned by name. Uh, some are generically mentioned by name. For instance, there was a category that Jude called filthy dreamers. I mean, that's probably not a great way that you want to be described, but he says they are filthy dreamers. But there are those who even today will say that they have a dream that God has given them or that they have a vision that God has given them when God's nowhere even near what they are saying or what they are trying to say has been revealed through the process of special revelation in their life and God's not anywhere near them. But just because they say, thus saith the Lord, and they, they make up something in their mind, listen, that's not a reason to follow them. We're going to be careful about that today. There are those who say they have prophetic utterances today. There are those who call themselves apostles and prophets, even today, even though uh, the apostleship gift, or the apostleship office, rather, is closed. And even though there are those, uh, listen, these are people who are trying to prey on those who are not firmly rooted, grounded in the faith. And some of them sound very appealing. And some of them have elements of truth, just like the trap has something inside of it that's good. There's a little bit of truth in even what the false teachers teach. But that's before the trap is set. And so there's filthy dreamers. I mean, so he names some generically, but he names some by name. Listen, here's a man who doesn't have any problem naming names. He says this, what about Korah? Or what about Balaam? Or what about Cain? These are those who had done wrong, who had usurped authority, who had taught false doctrine. And he calls them out by name, these false teachers. And then he names some of their descriptors. And there's way too many for us to look at tonight. But just as a, some examples, they uh, creep in unaware. Verse number four, they try to slide into the church without anybody knowing. They don't show their true intentions until they have made their connections within the church, and then they start to spread their pernicious doctrine. They deny the deity of Christ. Uh, they deny who Jesus Christ is. Well, he is a son of God, but he's not the son of God. Listen, that's blasphemy. That is not Bible doctrine, that he is just one of the sons of God. Uh, no, we understand that we were saved. We become the sons of God, and we become adopted into the family of God. But that's not what we've seen spoken of here, that he is just a created being like we are. No, he's God. There is no way around that. I and my Father are one. There's no way around that. And these 
filthy dreamers, uh, these false teachers, would say that Jesus Christ is not Lord. Verse number 15 says they're ungodly, with ungodly deeds and ungodly acts. And like I said, I can't wait to get into all those ungodlies there uh, in that verse where it's just, it's like he takes the hammer and he just blow after blow after blow. He's showing what the false teachers are doing. And so what Jude is doing in this book is like a police artist. He's creating a composite sketch to help identify these apostates so that you can go on TV and turn on TBN and say, no, I don't think so. You say, you say, did, did, you, did you just name, name a, a, a station? I did it, but it's not the only one. So that you can turn on, well, you don't turn on YouTube. I sound like I'm of, of an older age than I am. So you can go on the internets, um, uh, on the socials, and uh, you can go on and, and look at a, a, a video of a doctrinal issue, and you watch it at first, you say, mm, I don't think so, and have some discernment that that's not right. Listen, we've dealt with this here at Liberty Baptist Church. Every church has dealt with it. There are some who find teaching online or through podcasts or these other places without any discernment whatsoever, never asking for guidance from leadership, those who have led them to Christ or those who have tried to help them along the way. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not saying that I have all the answers. I, I'm neither perfect nor have all the answers, but I can help you identify that there's some pretty bad doctrine out there. And a lot of it is in the name of Christ while denying Christ and His Word all at the same time. So we see there's this description of false teachers, but then letter B, we also see there's a defense against false teachers. What I love about the book of Jude is it's not the ranting and raving of a stark, mad half-brother of Jesus. No, this is an epistle that gives a sober warning, all while also giving practical steps of how to counter, uh, counter false teaching. It's one thing to say false teachers are out there, mic drop. That's not really very helpful. It's another thing to say, there's false teachers out there. This is how you protect yourself. Wouldn't it be a shame to say, hey, there's somebody out there that wants to rob your house. Good luck. Like, well, that's not very comforting. Somebody out there that wants to rob your house. There's ways you can protect yourself. Some of them involve a certain amendment of the Constitution. Amen. And we're thankful for that. So here we see that it's not just the description of the false teachers, but there's defense. Listen, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. No, I'm not here tonight saying, boy, it's so bad. There's false teaching. It's awful out there. There's rotten Christianity. There's things that are being done in the name of Christ. There's these filthy dreamers that are even out there today purporting to be something when they're not. They're trying to fleece the flock. And all of that's true. But listen, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we don't need to hide or cower or, or, or try to kowtow to these entities. But rather we understand Jesus Christ is Lord and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And we not, not, need not be afraid. And there's this defense against the false teachers. And we'll look more at this later, but two of them would be this. Uh, verse number 20, build yourself up in the faith. It almost sounds like this. Add to your faith. Don't just be static. Don't just say that this is who I am and this is who I'm going to be, but grow in your Christian life. Verse number 21, keep yourself in the love of God. I'll tell you this, keeping yourself in the love of God will keep you out of a lot of trouble. Jesus said this, love God and love others. And all this hangs the law and the prophets. Love God and love others. And that's just some of the defense that we're given by Jude. He's not just saying, well, you might as well give up because false teaching's out there. And by the way, I feel like that's a lot of what modern Christianity, even good Christianity is today. It's kind of like we just resign ourselves. Well, it's the last days. There's perilous times are going to come. There's just bad stuff out there. So let's just, you know, our four, our, our four and no more, you know, are going to come to church. And that's just the way it's going to be because in the last time, nobody cares. Listen, the darker the night, the brighter the light. Uh, the more wild it gets out there, the more that there are some who are looking something for something that's sane and real. But we just have to be out there saying, well, no, no, we're not going to step back and let the false teachers go out there and proselytize and let the false teachers go out and be the ones that are on doors and the ones who are doing advertising campaigns and all these different things. No, no, we realize that Jesus Christ is Lord, so let's get after it. Because I'll tell you, there is some weird stuff out there. I will tell you, this coming Christmas season, there's going to be glitzy ads 
that are going to be out there about the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you, you'll know they won't be from independent Baptists because they'll be really sharp, all right? Uh, we're still using PowerPoint, all right, uh, to be able to do stuff. I'm not talking about us here. I'm talking about just in general, all right? Uh, but I'm talking about, like, the production value is like something you would see on cable television or something out of Hollywood. And last year, there was a viral video that was going out of a video about Jesus Christ that was being played on Times Square. Now, first of all, my radar went off there because I thought, you know, Times Square probably isn't going to allow a lot of biblical truth to be out there. But we watched it. Seemingly, on the big, it seemed like it was right on there. We looked it up afterwards. Brought to you by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. They have co-opted that of which we have taught and tried to bring people in and say, we're just like Christians. No, you're not. I say it kindly, but I say it truthfully, that a Mormon is not a Christian. No matter how much they want to present themselves so, no matter how many times they sing, how great thou art, and no matter how many people come and hear the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, which is pretty amazing, but guess what? Not amazing enough to get them to heaven. They can sell all the records and all the CDs. Boy, what's my, with my age tonight? Records? Uh, come on. Uh, they can sell all the eight tracks they want. It's not going to achieve heaven. You see how relevant this is today? But see, we don't need to be afraid of the Mormons. We don't need to be afraid of the Jehovah Witnesses. We don't need to be afraid of the compromising liberal Christianity that's out there today that takes the name of Christian but has nothing to do with Christianity. That's out there. But we can go out there with the purity of the gospel and know that the word still works. Number three, the readers of the book. Hey, who's supposed to be reading this book other than us? Well, let's see what Jude says. Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them. Okay. The beginning is from. The end is to. To them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Brother Sam, I couldn't help just thinking, reading this, thinking of your charge. There, there it is again, called. Uh, right there, uh, another thing that we had seen there. You say, well, I don't know what he's talking about. Well, you got to come to men's prayer. At least, well, half of you do. Um, but um, the, other half, the other half, you're out of luck. But uh, uh, so uh, he says, Here, here's what I'm writing this to. Those who are sanctified, those who are preserved, and those who are called. Do you know how he starts when he is dealing with an issue of false doctrine? He starts with a mega dose of doctrine. Hey, hey what do you do when you're really sick? they're going to give you a dose of medicine typically that they wouldn't normally give you because you need it. Usually when I have a need for antibiotics, uh, I get a Z-Pack. It's the only one that I can take just about because of my, uh, my allergies that I have. You know what they give you on the first day? Twice as much. You know what sometimes they'll give you that's not enough? Steroids. And I love those steroids because I just go to the gym and I just start, mm, man, I just start pounding it out. Let me tell you. Like, ah! um, like I, I, can't, I can't stop coughing, but I can lift a lot, you know. Uh, it's great. Why do they give you so much at the first? Because there's a great problem. It's got to be met with an even greater antidote. There's a great problem, false doctrine. What does it need to be met with? You know, churches should just teach less doctrine today. Well, that might be the path to grow a church and to have bigger offerings or to try to placate the crowd. But you know how we deal with false doctrine? We teach more true doctrine. He says, you know who I'm writing this to? To the ones who are sanctified. Sanctification, a, a real principle of the Word of God. Positional sanctification, that when we're saved, we're seated in heavenly places. Practical sanctification, that every day we're trying to be more like Christ. And then perfect sanctification, one day we will be in heaven and we will be completely set apart for God. That we're preserved, that eternal security is for the believer. Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he liveth to make intercession for him, that our salvation is secure inside of the hand of Jesus Christ, which is then secure inside of the hand of the Father. That's the book of John. And that we're called. 
And this doesn't have to do with preordained, irresistible salvation from before the foundation of the world. It's that as believers, God has a calling and a purpose laid upon us. God has a purpose for you tonight. That God has you on this earth now for a reason. If not, He would have just called you up the day you got saved. But he has a reason for you to be here. He has a reason for you to be in this church. He has a reason for you to minister to the people in your neighborhoods. That God has a calling upon your life. Well, pastor, you're called to be a pastor. Sure, I am, but you're called to be a Christian. And while I'm being a pastor, I might as well be a Christian too, amen? Because if I'm the pastor and not the Christian, well, I'd say we've got a little bit of a problem, don't we? But that's been my calling. I have a particular calling upon my life. But he's called us all to be believers. He's called us all to act like believers. He's called us all to look like believers. You say, oh, you're saying about the way we look? No, no, I'm not talking about a specific thing uh, necessarily other than when people see us, you know what they should see? Christ. I, I believe you could be dressed to the nines or you could be in your grubbies out in the garden and there could be someone that could come up to you and they could just say, there's something different about them. Because that calling that was laid upon them, they realized, I've got to be the Christian that God wants me to be. The readers of this book had seen God do incredible things in their life. And Jude wants to ensure those people that they would earnestly contend for the faith. These people in the early apostolic times had seen things that we can't even imagine. But even they needed encouragement. And they needed help. And they needed to earnestly contend for the faith. So... In the end, the, the title of this message, I don't know if I ever gave it to you. The title of the message is this, A Man Who Had Seen Some Things. Can you understand why that's the title now? Jude had seen some things, hadn't he? He grew up with Jesus. And I, I would say this, and I say this without trying to be disrespectful. Maybe it's going to come across that way. It would have been infuriating to grow up with Jesus. It, it would have been because he was perfect. And then you knew that we were talking about this in the car this afternoon. Certainly your mother is teaching you that Jehovah God has placed him in our family because he is going to save the world. She believed this. She believed this. Go to Luke chapter number one. Before the baby was born, he's ta she's talking with Elizabeth. There's no doubt of this unshakable faith of who Jesus Christ was. So she's giving that to her children. She's not holding that for herself. We know that Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart, but that's in reference to the day of Jesus' birth. It doesn't mean that she wouldn't have shared this with those who were living under the same roof because they would have had some questions. Jude probably went up to his mom and said, what does Jesus mean when he said he has to be about his father's business? What's, what, what does dad have to do around here? He said, well, remember what I told you? Remember where Jesus came from? And you need to believe on him like I believe on him, that he will save this world from their sins. Jude saw a lot of things. He saw a lot of things in Jesus Christ. But he saw a lot of things about how false doctrine wrecks lives. I read this and I read passion. You know why I love Jude? Passion. I mean, pure unbridled pressure still by the inspiration of the holy spirit again this isn't ranting and raving this is a man through holy spirit means has given us his heart i saw jesus i saw what false teaching had done and i want you to avoid what these devastating results could be when he when he realized that he saw jesus and he realized that he saw what false doctrine would do, it caused him to want to earnestly contend for the faith, ensuring that he lived a Christian life that wasn't going to be on the sidelines. He says, I see it. I've seen Jesus. I've seen what false doctrine can do. i got to get in the fight. And there's no doubt that he was a man who was willing to fight for the faith. I'll, I'll give you this example and we're done. A, f a few months ago, some of you will remember that Kaylee got into a car accident. It wasn't her fault. She was going down 138. She was coming out of Hilliard's, was trying to make a left turn into Duncan because we taught her well. Um, <laughs> Rivero's run on Duncan, and so she's driving into Duncan. I got to get Duncan on the way home. She's driving in. She was going to take a left turn. Someone told her to go, and then 
the hole was there. She didn't realize that someone was coming around, and that person came around and hit her. Um, some of you remember, I think we were supposed to have men's Bible study that night. I had to go over to check on her. I wasn't sure if she was all right at first. And uh, the Fletchers got there before me. She brought a pie. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you. If you just, uh, let me just give you a hint. If you ever get in an accident, Lisa will bring you pie at the scene. All right? <laughs> she wanted me to share that with everybody. All right? And Lisa, I know I was supposed to say that a while ago. I, I should have mentioned that. But I'll tell you. I mean, we're, we're in an accident scene. And she's like, Pastor, you need this. And it's a key lime pie. I'm like, tell me. Tell me that being the pastor is like the most awesome thing in the world. I mean, that's incredible. So, um, but anyway, so we're at the we're at the crime scene. I'll let Kaylee have some, by the way. But anyway, um, crime scene. No, we're at the scene of the accident. I gotta finish this up. All right, I'm gonna land this plane before it lands itself. Um, you know what really infuriated? Here we are. We're ready. All right, we're ready. You know what really infuriated me about that? The whole thing would have been so much easier to handle if the person who started this in the first place had stayed behind. Oh, that looks bad. Hit the gas and go. There would have been half a dozen cars that would have seen it. They were all too busy. None of them stayed. Now, it ended up being the insurance company ruled that it was the other person's fault. Thank the Lord. You know what would have made it a lot easier? If there had been one person who left a phone number. But they couldn't be bothered. They are too busy. They were too busy in the moment. And I will say this. I've been in situations where I kind of felt the same way too. Like, oh, I probably should stop, but oh, I'm going to be late. That may take a few minutes for the cops to come. But you know what? When it's your kid, you look at it different. I put it this way, when it's your family, you look at it different. Do you realize, here's Jude who says, this is my family, my brother. I've seen what false teachings about my brother can do. I can't look away. I've got to do something. By the way, that same passion you see in James, because James is a pretty spicy epistle in the sense that he doesn't mind saying what needs to be said. Now, we're not the same relation to Jesus as Jude was, but you know what? We have been adopted into the family. And there's some people that say some pretty bad things about my Jesus. There's some people that teach some pretty nasty things about my Jesus. And you know what? If that's my family, and I've seen Jesus, and I've seen the effect of what false doctrine can do. I can't look away. I got to do something. I'm passionate about this. You know why? Because as a pastor, I've seen so many people that we've won to Christ. Just go on YouTube and search out a question. And the next thing we know, they're denying the very things that they said they believed in not that long ago. Or people that watch something that looks very moving on television and excites the flesh. Ooh, that must be what real Christianity is all about. But there's no doctrine. There's nothing real there. It's all literally smoke and mirrors. And I mean literally smoke and mirrors. So as a pastor, do I get fired up? Yeah, I do. I do. But you know why? I've looked at my Jesus. I've looked at what false doctrine does. I won't look away. But that's for all of us. Is he your savior? He is. Have you seen what false doctrine has done within a church? Or within a family? Or within someone that you were discipling? Or trying to mentor? And see them go away? Hey, don't look away. Don't look away. Jude couldn't. We can't. We've got to do all we can to earnestly contend for the faith. And we'll learn more about this in this brief and bold letter over the next 24 verses. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.